All right, let's uh, begin. I'm Ira Melman. I'm a JCB editor and JEM board member and also employee of Genentech, which I'm supposed to say, so you can uh, dismiss anything as I say as being true. <coughs> Although I guess that's in, in this part of New York, it's maybe not a joke at, at the moment. Um, but it, I, I don't think it's, it hasn't affected Rockefeller, this, your neighbors across the street. Um, so I want to thank everyone for coming, thank the uh, speakers, thank the staff of the JEM and the JCB for organizing uh, what looks like a special meeting. And um, they asked me to give a couple of um, thoughts concerning. Um, uh, my own experiences, which I think uh, I can say for once in my life are kind of uniquely suited to this, um, just bit, give my own history. So um, I've been an editor, a board member of these two journals for probably 117, 118 years. Uh, I've lost count sometime a, a while ago. And also, sorry, I have, I'm fighting a cold, so I have no voice. I can't hear anything. Um, so if you ask a question, I will ignore you. And because I just can't hear. Um, so there's that. Uh, there's the fact that I was um, spent actually most of my life in academia um, as a cell biologist and immunologist. This is at, at Yale up the road. In fact, I had been a, a postdoctoral fellow here uh, with Ralph Steinman prior to that. Um, I was uh, scientific director of our cancer center, so which uh, starts the cancer connection. I also was a member of the Ludwig Institute for Cancer Research, um, which you know continued the cancer connection. Um, and then uh, 11 years ago, I moved from <clears throat> New Haven to um, California um, to take up a post at Genentech, where um, we are expected to continue to be scientists, which was the, the good news. In fact, it's all good news. Um, my first job there was. Uh, to run all of cancer research. And at Genentech, that's kind of a big deal because um, uh, it's, it's one of the leading uh, biotechnology companies in the field of cancer. And um, so I got experience with that because my experience in cancer was really more from the immunological side, which eventually, as you can see, a few years later, uh, took over. And my um, um, attentions have really been spent now entirely to cancer immunology and immunotherapy. But um, those first six years are really very informative uh, to learn about what works and what doesn't work uh, in cancer. So I'd like to just uh, take a couple minutes and share what I've learned kind of as a backdrop um, to frame some of the questions for this meeting. Um, cancer, of course, is a genetic disease. We'll come back uh, to that in just a second. Um, and the theory and uh, wish all along has been that if you can generate inhibitors that uh, targeted specific drivers of cancer, in this case, you're looking at a, a metastatic melanoma patient um, with the um, oncogenic uh, BRAF mutation, V600E allele. Um, if you can make uh, inhibitors of, of these drivers, you would um, cure or at least uh, elicit uh, terrific benefit for patients. And in fact, it looks like that that's the case with this particular individual. Um, but unfortunately, uh, when you take people like this and treat them uh, after these uh, sometimes spectacular responses, continue treating them for months, um, almost invariably they relapse uh, and uh, unfortunately die uh, from their disease. And <clears throat> this has to do with the fact that um, uh, there are now up to, I think, two dozen, if not uh, more, different mechanisms of escape around this inhibitor or this class of inhibitors uh, that, that cancer can do. Not just a, in fact, a rare uh, variant is, is a mutation in BRAF itself. It's usually uh, various workarounds that, that cancer can do. So what you learn from this kind of stuff is that, um, uh, and, and this is a, that was a dramatic example because in that case, you saw terrific benefit. More often than not, you didn't see benefit. Um, with targeted agents that looked anything like that. Um, so, but when you do see it, or when you see even modest benefit, you find that acquired resistance um, often limits uh, uh, the amount you can actually uh, produce in the clinic. Um, genetic evolution of cancers, um, another thing we've learned, I think, that, and certainly is, is true in the field, um, changes oncogene dependency patterns so that um, a tumor which perhaps at initiation was completely dependent on um, a mutant KRAS allele uh, later uh, in its life history uh, may not need it. Um, this is, I think, still controversial, but um, it's, it's something that uh, you know, I'm certainly taking away from our preclinical and clinical studies. 
Um, <clears throat> things that work are often very rare mutations that occur, and, and while there's some interest in them uh, and, and drugging them, and sometimes um, the, the results can be uh, quite nice, um, in, it's economically unfeasible, uh, at least for a large company, to develop drugs uh, to minor targets that have incidences of 0.5% you know, uh, or so across all cancer, uh, unless they exhibit dramatic efficacy. Um, that's always an out, but even even then, for a large company, that's a, that's a tall order. Um, the, the amount of, of income that you would see from that is is effectively statistical noise. Another uh, fourth important thing I've learned is that um, uh, you know if if you have a genetically complex cancer uh, with multiple drivers, you would like to drug two or if not more of them. Uh, but one of the um, facts that one sees from the clinic is that no matter how good your inhibitors are, um, the accrued or uh, uh, the, the amount of additive toxicity that you see as a consequence of treating patients with two or more agents is usually intolerable for the patient. Um, so that idea is, is a difficult one to do. There may be workarounds to that, um, but so far uh, we don't have um, the agents to really do it. Um, best approach is, I think, to a target mutant alleles and, and catastrophic translocations. Those are the ones, for example, in leukemia, those are the ones that seem to uh, react best uh, to targeted agents. And in fact, if you do have um, an inhibitor that is uniquely uh, selected for a mutant allele of something, then presumably the off-target or on-target toxicities associated with that inhibitor will be low, and perhaps that would be a circumstance um, where you could actually uh, uh, put, start putting two or three of these things together uh, to get uh, benefit. Now, um, as I said, cancer is a genetic disease, and um, this is something that's known, obviously, everybody here, um, but uh, what struck um, some of us in thinking about this is that as mutations accumulate as a cancer tries to improve its own fitness, um, tumors become progressive non-self in immunological terms, and uh, one wonders whether or not this actually might uh, specify some level of an Achilles heel for cancer, because the more non-self you become, the more likely um, you can train an immune response against um, a particular uh, tumor. So that uh, led uh, some of us into uh, worrying about how um, this works. <clears throat> this is um, a representation of the events that have to take place uh, during um, an immune response to cancer, which starts with down at the bottom with uh, dendritic cells or antigen-presenting cells capturing pieces of tumor, uh, uh, processing and presenting those antigens, um, presenting them to uh, uh, T lymphocytes and lymph nodes, and then those lymph no those uh, T cells then exit lymph nodes and re-enter the cancer uh, uh, bed uh, to the tumor bed to, to kill it. Um, this. Uh, works um, uh, and I think uh, has uh, listed so far two general classes of, of uh, immunotherapeutics um, that have had um, some you know, very significant effects in the clinic. Uh, one is up here, which is ipilimumab, which is an antibody of CTLA-4, which is uh, thought to release a break on T cell proliferation, uh, relieving uh, a so-called checkpoint. And the other, uh, which ha um, uh, down here, uh, are antibodies that block the interaction between PD-1 and PD-L1. PD-1 being a negative regulator present on, on T cells. Generally speaking, um, the effects here are greater than the effects with CTLA-4, I think, to um, uh, not an insignificant extent because the toxicities associated with using anti-PD-1 or anti-PD-L1 antibodies are much, much lower, so you have a much greater level of therapeutic index. Again, these are all considerations you have to take into account, um, not just when you're studying these things biologically, but if you want to try and uh, move your, your observations into the clinic. Now, um, we don't know a lot about this because, in fact, um, there's now new evidence to say that CTLA-4 may all be working down in the tumor bed by depleting regulatory T cells, and at the same time, PD-1 and PD-L1 seems to expand T cell responses. Um, these mechanisms are clearly not mutually exclusive, but nevertheless, um, it's just all, all to say that there's a lot yet to learn about um, he, even how the drugs work that we think work um, well in the clinic. Now, um, the excitement um, with the PD-1, PD-L1 agents um, really comes from uh, a realization now that virtually every cancer type, to a greater or lesser degree, uh, both liquid tumors as well as solid tumors, can be shown to uh, elicit some level of clinical benefit, uh, sometimes spectacular levels of clinical benefit, um, to these treatments. Um, that sounds great, and in fact, I think um, it is correct to refer to this um, as, a, as a, a, a dramatic breakthrough, but 
um, the fact remains that only a small fraction of cancer patients, um, depending on indication, somewhere between 10 and 30 percent, really will exhibit uh, dramatic benefit um, as a consequence of these types of treatments. So there's a lot happening here uh, that also uh, limits um, these kinds of therapies. And uh, in that sense, um, it's no uh, more of a magic bullet or, or, or less complex to deal with than the targeted therapies. One of the reasons for that is uh, that all tumors um, are not immunologically equivalent. Um, so uh, these are uh, just examples of um, immunohistochemistry uh, type stains of uh, uh, tumor sections uh, from three different tumors to show that um, the immunological phenotypes we have to deal with. One is called the immune inflamed. Um, these are tumors that have um, robust um, infiltration by um, T cells, both CD4 and CD8 T cells. Um, these are the ones that uh, have pre-existing immune responses that uh, generally can be amplified as a consequence of PD-1, pdl one therapy. Next group is the immune excluded group, which is uh, super interesting, um, uh, and I think will next yield um, uh, some some. Um, breakthroughs, but uh, at the moment, not quite yet. Uh, what happens here is that there also seems to be a, an objective T cell response, but the T cells are stuck in the peritumoral stroma, uh, and in fact, can't negotiate their way into the interior of the tumor and encounter tumor cells um, to kill them. Um, so um, T cell responses may take place, but there's a physical and or immunosuppressive barrier uh, to entry of those T cells. Um, finally, there's um, the immune desert, where there does not seem to be an objective T cell response at all, um, but the reasons for that are entirely unclear. Um, and I think I would like to point out one last feature of all of these different immune phenotypes is that within any one cancer indication, the, the tumor mutation burden, in other words, the, the frequency of mutations that one finds in these tumors is pretty much the same, um, meaning that the neoantigens that the T cells would like to be responding to are being made. Uh, they're just not being recognized and or um, affected uh, very well. Now, just to end, um, I think uh, where that leaves us uh, and as, as a field and, and uh, where that uh, leaves us for uh, today is um, there can be terrific benefit associated with uh, uh, targeted therapies, but that benefit is transient. Uh, there can be terrific benefit associated with immunotherapies, but that benefit really re uh, affects only a relatively small number of patients. And the hope has always been that if we can combine uh, conventional and immunotherapeutics together, um, we would uh, not just add to, but perhaps even synergize um, these two classes of treatment together in, or, in order to uh, bring uh, more and more benefit to cancer patients. So I just uh, have um, four points, I think, uh, um, uh, kind of my own challenges to uh, my fellow speakers as well as um, uh, other participants in the audience. Uh, just things to think about. Um, in other words, uh, how can we, first of all, build and uh, integrate our knowledge about cancer genetics and, and cell biology with cancer immunity? Because these two things do go together. Um, uh, tumor genotype does affect immune phenotype uh, by altering cytokine release levels, chemokine release levels, um, other a, a variety of, of, of features that we haven't even begun to understood yet. Um, how can we embrace this as a new field uh, and do this in a new way, not simply as translational research, um, whatever that is, but uh, really as basic research into human biology? Um, and I think this is um, a, a, an enormous challenge. Um, third challenge, I think, is, is something that, that is in some ways the most provocative, which is to, how is it that we can distinguish interesting findings from useful findings? Um, uh, as scientists, we find anything new pretty much as being interesting, particularly if it tells us something new. But not all of those um, things necessarily are useful with respect to designing therapy. That doesn't mean that you ignore that which is interesting, but um, when deciding what to do with an interesting finding, you have to distinguish between whether it's interesting and also, in a realistic sense, um, useful. Uh, as to what is going to happen when you move that finding into patients. And finally, um, uh, you know, one thing that's, that certainly always stood me well is to question everything. Um, and the other thing that uh, I've always, always enjoyed doing is to have a great meeting when you're about to, to see uh, some uh, really exciting leaders in, in this uh, uh, exciting and ever-expanding field.